My wife, uh, my wife did call me and uh, Daniel over there, Daniel, your mask. My wife did call me and said the reason that we didn't get mail on Saturday was because the, somebody came under the post office the, and had COVID. And so they had to deal with that. So, so as I've said before, you don't know the, there's so much uncertainty in it, but you got to look at what's the expected value, right? So if the probability is low, but the value turns out to be high, then, then you're good. So, but yeah, there is a lot of uh, decision making under uncertainty out there. So we'll give everybody like one minute. Looks like most people are here. Um, one thing I forgot to mention um, is that the person that has the highest total points at the end, you're gonna have 200 points, um, wins the uh, coveted ninja sword. Um, and uh, some of you have maybe seen people that have the ninja sword. Um, some, Professor Clark, won two of them while he was an undergraduate here. So um, if you go into his office, he has a couple of those there. So anyway, uh, this is what you're, uh, you know, get, get you excited about and making sure that, you know, if you get that extra two points on the exam by studying a little bit harder, you could end up with the ninja sword. All right. Um, the other thing is, uh, on Mondays, um, we have a band pick of the week, and uh, which some of you, in fact, most of you, more than, well, more than half of you have had me in class before. So um, the band pick of the week for this week is uh, Steep Canyon Rangers. How many, have, how many have heard of Steep Canyon Rangers? Oh, good, yeah. 2013 Grammy Award for Best Bluegrass Album. Um, interestingly, they, you know who, um, uh, um, it's, it's uh, they're, they're really good at uh, uh, the banjo, so you might wanna, you might wanna take a listen to uh, 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 Steep, Canyon, uh, Steep Canyon Rangers. Um, all right. Uh, any, any questions on what we've been doing so far? Anything from leftover? All right. Okay, so uh, last time we closed with this idea that um, you can use econ to, to discuss efficiency, um, but then we mentioned that maybe you don't want to have the law be efficient, and we talked about uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, and we talked about from econ 402, you know um, that uh, a, 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 a poll tax or just a tax on, um, you know, per person doesn't affect people's behavior. Uh, and so the, um, that's a very efficient tax, but people might not see it as being very equitable. And so there's this trade-off between efficiency and equity. And so um, economic analysis allows you to do that. So when you're out there deciding what the law ought to be, um, you can decide about that. But you've got to realize this, this is trade-off. And then we were talking a little bit uh, about if you, uh, utilitarianism in Econ 415. If you sort of think back, um, and what is that about? That, uh, Jeremy Bentham, right, talked about that. And the idea was that you would uh, you, you'd do things which add up to the greatest utility for everybody. Um, so if I'll, uh, you pass a law, if it, what it's going to do is add up to uh, uh, the efficiency for everyone. Um, but then the, how do you measure that, right? I mean, that's, that's you know, a question that, again, we addressed in Econ 415 for those of you who had public choice. But, I mean, or is it even possible to do that? Uh, so um, that's, uh, again, something that uh, economic analysis allows you to do in terms of looking at what the law is. Um, and then uh, also you might think about what you can predict what the effects of different rules of the game are. Uh, so as an economist, when you're in law school, and we've had a number of our 
uh, econ grads have gone on to law school and um, you know, clerked for Supreme Court justices, et cetera. Um, but well, you know, one of the things that allows you to do is, is to say, well, gee, um, what is the effect of this, diff of this rule of the game compared to something else? So just to give an example, we're gonna talk about contract law, but let's think a little bit about uh, a contract. And suppose that um, you're a rock and roll band and uh, you're going to play at uh, some big venue. Um, and what's happened is that you have this contract, you're supposed to show up. And uh, what happens is um, the venues sold all these tickets and they've uh, spent a lot of money in, uh, uh, to, to in preparation for the concert, advertised, etc. cetera. Um, and then you're driving, you guys are driving to the concert and your the van or whatever you have breaks down, right? And you don't make it to the concert, okay? So what happens is that the people who are, um, you know, running the venue, uh, they have to, uh, you know, refund the money uh, and they're out all the expenditures that they made for the, um, you know, for the concert. So the question is, um, Who's going to be liable, right? You could say, well, gee, you know, it really wasn't our fault. We didn't know that the van was going to break down. Um, and who, who, so what's going on is what you got, you got a risk here, right? Um, right, there's some risk that this contract's not going to be fulfilled. So any contract that you get into, and again, we'll talk more about it in uh, chapter three, but any, any contract that you get into, there's some risk that it's not gonna get, uh, you know, that something's not gonna uh, be fulfilled. So let's, if we're to think about it, is you ought to allocate the risk to those who can, so you wanna allocate to the risk to those who can, uh, who can best uh, take care of it, right? Or, or... So, so whoever could bear the, be able to bear the burden of the risk. So in this case, it's probably better for you, or if, if we were to allocate what that risk is, it's probably easier for you to make sure that you've got a backup plan, your band has a backup plan to getting there, than it is for the venue uh, to take on that uh, take on that risk. So the idea is that if you, yeah. Oh, what about when the person who can bear the risk isn't necessarily the person who has the ability to control uh, the probability of the risk? Well, that's that's part of again. That's when we're talking about the the he was he was saying. What if, what if the person that is best able, what did you say about best able to bear the risk is? Is not the person that can control it. Is not the person that can control it. Well, that's what I mean by best able to bear it. Okay. That is, you, you have a better chance of controlling the risk than does the venue have of your not showing up. You, you, and so, um, Again, we're gonna, chapter, chapter three, we're gonna talk more about contract law, but the point here is we're just sort of summarizing the economic analysis of this is to say, if we were to be, if we're gonna make that contract efficiently, what we ought to do is we ought to allocate the risk to the people that can, uh, can best bear the risk that is most cheaply, uh, most efficiently be able to, to bear what that risk is. Um, and so sometimes you may not know what that is, but, um, but the point is, is that when you're making the law, how are contract law supposed to look like? You know, who's supposed to pay if the contract is uh, if the contract isn't fulfilled? How do you want to structure that thing? Um, let's just think about uh, another uh, efficiency uh, idea. Um, what about if you uh, arrest people on? Drug charges. Okay. Right, and you put them in jail. Right, or put them in prison. What should the law be in terms of uh, 
should we have uh, laws against crystal use of crystallized methamphetamine? I don't know if you uh, ever get the Hills Daily News or file this stuff. What do you find? If you look at who gets arrested in Hillsdale, it tends to be people who have crystallized methamphetamine. They tend to be addicted to it, or they tend to be uh, meeting a demand because there are people who are addicted to it who are trying to get it, right? So question is, how efficient is that law? Um, and what should the punishment be? As an economist, and as an economist analyzing what the law is, you wouldn't be looking at um, uh, so much, uh, gee, is it uh, immoral in some sense to be using uh, these drugs, or is the, uh, we've talked a little bit about it in uh, 105, are we making it legitimate to use these drugs if they're legal, okay? You'd be looking at what, what happens if you make the law this way. And what happens if you make the law the other way? Now, it costs, anybody know about how much it costs to put somebody in prison for a year? Well, it's not that, it's $35,000 a year for one individual, right? If we're gonna stick you in prison, it's gonna cost about $35,000 to keep you there, all right? So, what if we made it so that instead of putting you in prison, we made you, uh, which we, uh, uh, Judge uh, Sarah Lisney has started in Hillsdale County recently, um, is a drug court uh, where you, instead of going to jail, you have to go to drug rehabilitation. And you have to make sure that you show up with drug rehabilitation, et cetera. And so is that gonna be more efficient? Um, one of the things to think about is once you have somebody in prison, right, and they come out, does that reduce the probability that they're going to be hired uh, in, a, in a job? Um, and uh, what do you do if, uh, uh, if, if they have a family and they're the sole breadwinner or whatever, right? Those are the things you think about as an economist. You say, well, you want to make the law such it's the most efficient way of, of dealing with the situation. That, that, you know, that's just sort of the, the, the point here. Now, um, you could use the law to redistribute wealth, right? So we could say, okay, we could say, all right, you know, we're concerned about this inequality that's out there, right? I mean, lots of discussion about that and, uh, you know, the... If you listen to the presidential elections, you know, they're gonna be talking about uh, how some people are really wealthy and we ought to have a tax that, uh, you know, that uh, we ought to raise the corporate income tax uh, because uh, we want to, uh, you know, start giving all this uh, tax breaks to the rich, et cetera, right? Um, so we're worried about in, uh, income inequality and we might say, well, hey, here's what we could do. We could make laws that benefit consumers. Right? We're going we're gonna to redistribute wealth by making the law such that um, you have to have a, uh, uh, that, that it makes it so that uh, uh, milk is cheaper or it makes it so that uh, first time home buyers uh, get this or uh, people who are in rental housing uh, get, get this other thing, right? So we could make the law to try to affect a, uh, uh, an advantage to the people who are low income. Um, if you're gonna redistribute wealth, it turns out, if you sort of think about it for a bit, um, it's better to not try to use the law to redistribute wealth, but rather th th that is in terms of making laws that f try to favor a certain group over another group, um, but rather simply to use a broad-based tax, and if you think back to Econ 402, public finance, we, you know, we talk about broad-based taxes being a, more efficient, but then, but basically taxing people through a broad-based tax and then redistributing that tax revenue to the poor uh, is a more efficient way of doing about that, and just here's some reasons that might be true. First of all, it's hard to target. Can you target it efficiently? Um, not probably. Um, 
For example, if what I did was I made a law that favored consumers over producers, uh, what's the problem? Rich consumers will benefit and low to moderate income business owners might lose out, right? Um, if you look, you know, sm a small business person uh, may, uh, the, you know, the, the, the law may favor the consumer over the small producer, and the small producer is not nearly as wealthy as some of the consumers that are, that are being benefited. So it's not a very efficient way to redistribute wealth. Second thing, if you think about it, is that when, when, you, when you make this law, um, it's difficult to predict the effects on the favored group. So if we look at, so I've passed this law to favor a certain group to try to redistribute income. So one of the things that we noted last time, or the uh, lecture earlier, um, was that uh, if you have a law that does equal pay for equal work, which just yesterday I was watching somebody uh, discussing that that's running for, uh, for office. Um, so if you, if you had a law equal pay for equal work, what did we say last time? You might have this inadvertent uh, result that you've reduced the price of discriminating. Right, so there, if there actually is discrimination against women and you require everybody to pay the same for whether it's pay, uh, work by men or work by women, um, we noted that uh, Gary Becker's uh, piece on economics of discrimination pointed out that you've altered the price of discriminating and made it less expensive to discriminate. So you may actually end up with the, the people that are being discriminated against worse off than if you allowed the market to work and allowed them to outcompete uh, and, and people, businesses that are uh, l less discriminatory um, will actually outcompete the businesses that are more discriminatory. A third thing is, as with any law, there's a transactions cost. Think about equal pay for equal work. What do you got to do? You got to, let's say you think that your work, you're, you know, you're a woman and you think that your work is uh, equal to uh, what the men in the business are doing. Uh, let's say it's Walmart, right? Uh, so what do you got to do? You got to go out and hire an attorney to say, hey, the, yes, this, this is why we think this, uh, you know, this person's work is equal to the value of this person's work equal to the value of this other person's work, right? So you're going to have so you're going to have litigation costs. Sort of think about that. We've got to hire attorneys. We got to have uh, you know a court s session. Uh, you know suits are are uh, not inexpensive. But also, if we think back to Econ 415, if what I'm going to do is I'm going to redistribute wealth through the legal system, I'm going to get rent seeking. And from Econ 415, and we talked a little bit about it before, what does rent seeking mean? Rent seeking means I'm going to spend resources if what the law does, it allows, the, if the law can do this, it can in, uh, benefit one group at the expense of another. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and hire a lobbyist, and I'm going to spend up resources hiring lobbyists to make it so that I get benefited. So if you have a, uh, if you have some uh, method of uh, redistributing wealth by making it so that one group is favored over another, I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to try and go out and have it so that my group gets a law that benefits me. And so you'll use up resources, Gordon Tullock's uh, famous uh, article on rent seeking, but what he means by, by rent seeking is that the, you, you are using the political process to benefit yourself. And so even if you just looked at simply some people lost and other people gained, right? So it's just a pure transfer. That is, I 
uh, I was able to get a law that benefited me by $100 and it cost you $100. It's not a pure transfer because I'm using up resources in order to get that law to pass. I'm, I'm hiring lobbyists and I'm trying to affect things and then you're trying to hire lobbyists to keep it from happening and if anybody's ever been involved in uh, uh, political process, ever worked in a legislative branch, or ever worked for as a, you know, an intern to a congressman or something. Uh, what do you know? Uh, one of the wealthiest places in the United States is K Street, right, uh, in uh, Washington D.C., where the where the, the lobbyists are located. So there's a, I don't know if any of you've thought of, you know, gee, when I graduate, I want to be a lobbyist, um, but it's not a bad job, right? Um, in fact, it's a job that's quite lucrative. Uh, and uh, you affect the uh, political process, you affect you know, what the law is. So um, I know you don't really think, gee, I'm gonna go to college so I can become a lobbyist. Um, uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it just lobbying is a, um, it's part of what we would expect if your government can do more than as, uh, Hayek talked about, you know, the protection of life, liberty, and property. Once, once government can do all sorts of stuff, uh, and Mises talked about it, you know, from Econ 105, uh, you, know, you, get, you know, once government intervenes, uh, it causes unintended consequences, and other people then try and uh, affect that. So um, uh, rent-seeking is also part of this transactions cost of redistribution if what you're trying to do is use the law in order to uh, redistribute wealth from uh, some people to another. And then the last thing that we, uh, you know, just referred to was uh, it causes more distortion in the economy than a broad-based tax. That is, if I were to um, had, a, had something which benefited renters versus uh, people who are, uh, you know, just say, hey, we're, we're going to redistribute wealth to renters, right? Um, we're going to pass a law that makes it so that um, you can't evict people, right? What do you got going on right now? With COVID-19, uh, you have laws against uh, uh, being able to evict people, right? So if, what if we did that in general? What if it wasn't just a COVID-19, a temporary thing? What if we said, hey, we're gonna make it so that if you're, uh, you know, if you're gonna rent to people, uh, you can't evict them. And you say, well, that, and that's really good because you know, low income, renters tend to be lower income people. Well, of course, what will that do? That will have all sorts of distortions in the rental housing market, right? If I know that I can't evict you, um, I'll have to try to figure out a way to make sure that you're gonna, you're gonna pay me. And well, that more expensive to produce rental housing, there'll be less rental housing, it'll drive up the price of rental housing, right? So uh, what, uh, the, what, what the, the uh, Kuder and Ullin argue is that it's better to, to, rather than to use the, uh, for these four reasons, it's better to go out and just redistribute wealth by taxing uh, through a broad-based tax, taking up that revenue, and then distributing that revenue to low-income people than it is by trying to use the legal system uh, to try to uh, redistribute, redistribute wealth. All right, so that takes us to the end. You know, th we finished the introduction, and what do we just do? We basically said, oh, we're, we're summarizing things or uh, um, telling you about things that we're gonna be developing more fully as we move through the through the through the class. So we just sort of give you a, a, a big picture of why why you want to use or how you can use economics to study the law. Now, um, people are in here with a, a varied background in uh, economic uh, theory. Although you've all had uh, Econ 202. Uh, and 203, um, and some of you had 105 or whatever, but, and some of you had intermediate micro, some of you hadn't. So we're just gonna quickly go over uh, some of the, uh, the chapter two uh, economic theory, right? So just, what do we know? Just, you know, again, this isn't rocket surgery here, but um, we got maximiz maximization under constraint, right? That's 
that's what economics is about. So when you're looking at the, the law, what we're going to do is we're going to realize that you got maximization under constraint and just sort of just recall what we've been talking about over the course of the years. You have marginal benefits generally decline, right, and marginal costs generally increase. And where do you try to go? You try to get to our marginal benefit equals marginal cost, okay? Uh, and just sort of a re remember that and notice that's what happens when you have a demand and supply curve, right? Because you remember that uh, demand is the marginal benefit. And we have that supply is marginal cost. And what do you do? You got an upward sloping demand curve, uh, excuse me, you have a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. And so what happens if we have uh, supply and we have demand and we got P and Q, uh, where do you end up, right? You end up with the supply, which is marginal cost, demand equals marginal benefit. And so what do you do? You, you maximize the, the net surplus uh, by going to where uh, demand and supply curves are equal. Another thing that you, um, some of you have had, uh, Talk about an Econ 402, you do it in intermediate micro, um, and that is uh, indifference curves. And we'll use this uh, at some uh, later uh, point, but to, what do you have? You have a indifference curve, what does that say? We'll call that U0. Along an indifference curve, these are all the points we have equal utility. So that's why it's, uh, we put it as u. And you have two goods. This is good x and this is good y. And the, so when you did uh, an indifference curve analysis, what do you do? You say, OK, I'm going to draw you a picture of, because remember Rod Stewart's album, Every picture tells a story, right? Econ 105, talk about that one. Um, but every picture tells a story. So whenever you draw a, a, any graph or uh, in, a, in a, an economic analysis, whenever you draw a graph, there's got to be a story behind it, right? And just being able to draw the graph doesn't help if you can't tell the story that goes along with it. So uh, an, uh, an indifference curve says, OK, I'm equally happy along all these points. So it says that if, if I'm going to have this much x and this much y, we'll call that x1 and y1, then if I could have less x, I take away some x, I've got to get more y to keep me equally happy. And there's going to be some trade-off between x and y, right? And we, we call that the margin rate of substitution, OK? But the point being is that we could, we, all we're saying is that there's, um, that I can, if I, if I to, to make you equally happy, if I take some from one good away, you got to get more of the other good. Uh, and so what you do is you put, if I get more of both goods, then I'm happier than if I have less. And so what happens is, as you move that direction, you move to higher indifference curves, what does that mean? That utility is higher. If we can somehow measure utility, uh, if we have a if of utils uh, uh, to measure utility, what happens is as I move this direction, I'm getting uh, higher and higher uh, utility levels. So then what happens is where, where is the consumer going to end up? Where are you guys going to end up? And can we draw a picture that tells that story? And in order to do that, what do we do? We draw a budget line. And we draw it like this and says, what is that? That is, right? And that's, so there's some, and then what is that? That's your income, right? That's your income. And so we say, OK, there's some, if what happens is I spent all my, all my income on x, I can buy that much x, right? And if I spend all my income on y, I can buy that much y. So there's some trade-off 
in if I buy a little bit less X, I can buy a little bit more Y, and what is that trade-off? What are we going to call that trade-off? Head in different curves, right? What's telling me the rate at which I can trade off Y for X? Like the price ratio, right? The price ratio is what tells you that, right? If, if, if the price of X is twice as much as the price of Y, you know, so if you had the price of X equal two times the price of Y, then what would happen is if it costs $4 for X and $2 for Y, if I buy another X, I got to give up two Y's, right? So the price ratio is going to tell you the rate at which you could uh, move across that, right? So what's going to happen? Higher incomes, right? Higher incomes are going to be farther out. If I have more income, then if I, you know, if I buy, if I spend all my money on X, I could buy that much X. If I spend all my money on Y, I can spend that much Y. And the price ratio is going to determine what the slope of this thing is, right? If it's, if, if uh, you know, if uh, it, it goes steeply like that, then uh, I can only get a little bit more Y when I give up X, right? If it's really flat, then if I give up X, I can get a lot more Y. So it just depends on what the price ratio is. And so then what do you do? Well, we're going to say, what am I trying to do? We just started out is that I'm trying, it's a maximization under constraint, right? I'm trying to maximize my total utility given what my income is. And so what will happen there is we're going to go, if we have x and y, right? I'm going to get to that indifference curve that's the farthest out, right? I'm, as these indifference curves move out this way, what's going to happen? My utility's going up. I can't get out here, right? Because my budget line doesn't let me get out there. I wouldn't be inside here because if I was inside there, I could always increase my utility by getting more of both goods, right? So the, what happens then is that we get to where the tangency of the indifference curve with the tangency of the budget constraint, that's where you're maximizing your utility given how much money you got, right? So uh, sometimes it's useful to use this analysis to show people what's going to happen. So, uh, for example, if you, if you think back to Econ 402, if you had that, or intermediate micro, um, if I have X and Y, and I start out U0, and I do something that makes Y more expensive, then what's going to happen is I'm going to move that budget line in now. Because if I spent all my money on, on, the price of X didn't change, so it stays anchored here. But if the price of Y went up, then what would happen is I'd move, instead of being able to buy that much Y, I could only buy that much Y. And so if we did that, sort of think through here, I'd have a new budget line that would look like that. That means I'm going to end up with a lower indifference curve than I had before, right? Because now I can't get to U0 because my budget line is now here. So what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with some indifference curve there, and I'm going to end up with a different combination of X and Y. And so what do you got? You got two things that are going on. One is my income is lower. And so that's going to change what I'm going to buy, right? And the other is that the price ratio has changed. So that I'm going to have two effects here. I'm going to have, I'm going to have an income effect because what happened was when the price of Y went up, I now have less 
income, right? And I have a substitution effect that is the price of x relative to the price of y has changed. And so again in Econ 402, uh, when we talk about it, if you tax a good, if what happens is you tax a good, what are you going to do? You're going to change the price ratio and we're going to make it, if I put a, if I put a tax on, uh, if I put a tax on cars, okay? And let's say I put a tax on cars but not on trucks. I got two things going on. One is, now with the same amount of income, I can't buy so much stuff as I did before because now it costs more to buy cars. But two is, the cars have now become more expensive relative to trucks and so I'm going to have people that are going to change their preference or change what they buy from cars to trucks. So anytime that we pass a law that uh, uh, does something, let's say we pass a law that makes it so that cars have to get uh, a higher uh, miles per gallon, okay? Well, then what's going to happen? Um, what I'm going to make it now, I'm going to make it more expensive to have certain kinds of cars, right? Um, and I'm going to make it so that the the um, you know, the way the the way this thing actually works is your fleet has to have a certain miles per gallon, uh, and so when if the fleet has to have certain miles per gallon and your General Motors what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to sell so many trucks, right? Because they can't get more miles per gallon. So you're not going to be able to sell so many trucks to make it so you, you make the, so you hit the law. So what's going to happen? Now what's going to happen is trucks are going to get more expensive and, and, and you'll start, you'll have to make more uh, goofy little cars and uh, not that little cars are goofy, but um, but you'll have to make more little cars uh, and then you got to get rid of them, right? So the point is that you can use economics to sort of work your way through the unintended consequences of what happens when you pass a law, right? If I, if I have a law that requires that your sales have to uh, reach so many miles per gallon, then that's not just going to change, uh, you know, how many miles per gallon people get, right? It's going to cause all sorts of other things. So the point here is that I can use economic analysis uh, to work my way through um, what the unintended consequences of, uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a law is. And when we, if we were to pass a tax law, uh, we oftentimes would use the, this indifference curve analysis just to make the point that you've got the two effects going on, right? If I tax a particular good, I've now made it uh, more expensive relative to another good, and so that'll cause us to substitute from the tax good to the other good, but also we got less income, and so what do you call goods that as your income rises, you buy less of them? Louder? Yeah, inferior goods, right? So we talked about inferior goods and normal goods are goods where your income goes up, you buy more of it, right? And so what the income effect from a particular good being taxed is leads you to think through, okay, is this a normal good or is this an inferior good, right? And so there's, uh, again, the point just being is that you can use all your economic analysis to go out and uh, predict what's going on when you have a, uh, when, when you're uh, passing a law. And again, um, this, this is useful not just if you're, uh, you know, in, in, in law school analyzing, a law, uh, you know, what, what the legal system looks like, um, but it's also useful when you're making laws, right? And so if you, how many have ever interned for us state or uh, uh, congressional representative? Right, a few of you, okay. So um, if you get a job working with them, uh, you need to be able to explain to them, okay, if you do this, if you make the law this, this is what's going to happen, which you hadn't maybe had thought about. Okay? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I was on the uh, Senate Republican policy staff for a number of years, uh, actually right before I 
came to Hillsdale. Um, and uh, so that was part of what I did. I left teaching in order to do what? Basically to teach the Michigan senators, if you do this, here's what's going to happen, right? Um, and then uh, I, uh, I left again, I, you know, I came to Hillsdale and then a guy named John Engler won the governorship and asked me to come back. To, uh, so I took a leave and I was a deputy state treasurer and did the tax policy um, and some other analysis for the, for the, so then I was in the, what was I trying to do? I was trying to explain to the, the uh, uh, executive branch, okay, uh, John, if, you know, if we are supporting this, here's what's going to happen, not just what I'm thinking. And then I eventually was, went to Congress and it was a congressional chief of staff for a bit, took another leave. And what was I doing? I was out there explaining to uh, Congressman Nick Smith, okay, when this bill comes in front of budget committee, here's what's going to happen, right? So it's just basically using economic theory to think through, here's what the, if you pass this law, here's what's going to happen. And if you want to accomplish something, here's what the law needs to do, right? Here, here's, a, here's a law that's going to accomplish the thing that you want, want, want to accomplish and, and, uh, and to work through that. So um, again, you can use uh, uh, this uh, law and economics in a, in a number of places that you might not have, uh, might not have thought about. Uh, another interesting aspect of economic theory is in game theory. Um, and again, in Econ 415, uh, we talked a bit about game theory. Um, and uh, if you've had intermediate micro, uh, I know Professor Clark talks about game theory. Um, we uh, have a, a game theory class. It's uh, a joint, uh, um, a joint uh, with the uh, math department. The math department actually teaches it, but you can get economic credit for it. Um, how many have taken, anybody taken that game theory class? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, what we're gonna just, you know, we're not gonna go into game theory in great detail, but one of the things that uh, we might focus on is um, the prisoners, what's called the prisoner's dilemma. And um, when you look at when people are uh, bargaining, um, one of the things that we, what, what you might want to do when you, when you uh, address what a law is, uh, what the law, what the effect of the law will be, or uh, what should the law look like, uh, one of the things you might want to think about is what happens um, in, a, in a bargaining situation. Um, and what, what happens in a prisoner's dilemma is you have to talk about what happens one of what's called a dominant strategy, right? And so players have a dominant strategy if, what, what does a dominant strategy mean? It's your best strategy no matter what the other person does. It's your best strategy no matter what Okay, so it doesn't mean a strategy that is going to um, make you the winner in some sense and that you'll gain more than the other person. It's just that no matter what the other person does, that's your best strategy. That's what we mean by a dominant strategy. Now, um, if we were just to, well, what, what happens in the prisoner's dilemma is that The parties all have a dominant strategy, but it turns out that the payoff to everybody from the dominant strategy, from their playing their dominant strategy, is worse than if they all cooperated, okay? So let me just give you an example here. Um, it's sort of a standard example. So when you, a standard way of looking at game theory is to, uh, is to put the, what's called a payoff matrix. And what the payoff matrix does is it gives what the payoff will be from uh, the different strategies for each of the players. 
Okay. So let's say we have player A here and we have player B up here. Um, and so then what we're going to have is we're going to have player A strategy is to steal or to not steal. That's the two strategies, right? I can steal or I can not steal. Same with player B. Player B can steal and not steal, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, what this thing tells me, what's the playoff to pair players A and B if they both steal? What's the payoff to players A and B if they both, uh, if, if A steals and B not steals? What if player A doesn't steal and player B steals? And then what happens if they, if they both steal? So there's different ways of, of putting it, but normally what happens is you put the, in this corner, you put player A's return, and up here you put player B's return. So let's say uh, there's uh, four is the total amount of uh, dollars or utils or whatever you want to call it. That's the payoff uh, in the, 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 if they're both stealing. Now let's suppose that Player B, or excuse me, player A does not steal and they get two, okay? And player B, if they steal and A not steals, they're going to get seven. Now, suppose that if A steals and B doesn't steal, it's seven and two, to sort of make it the uh, symmetric here. Um, and let's suppose that we make it six and six is the payoff if they both don't steal. Well, let's take a look at this and say, okay, what is, what is the, uh, uh, what, what is each party gonna do? I'm trying to figure out what's the solution to this game, okay? And the solution to this game says, first of all, what do you do? You look for a dominant strategy, and if a, and if a player has a dominant strategy, you know that's what they're gonna do. That's the best thing they can do no matter what the other person does, that's what they're going to do. So what do we notice? We notice that if we go look at what, what is A, if we look at A, if um, B steals, A's best return is to steal, right? If B doesn't steal, their best return is to steal. So what happens? A has a dominant strategy uh, is to uh, steal, right? A's dominant strategy is to steal. No matter what B does, whether B steals or doesn't steal, A's best strategy is going to be uh, to, to, to steal, right? So uh, if we, so if, you know, if B steals, they're gonna steal. If B doesn't steal, they're gonna, then A's gonna steal. But you got the same thing happening with B, right? It's going to turn out what? B's going to have a dominant strategy, which is to steal. I mean, clearly, you, 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 set, the, you, know, you set the payoffs so that this happens, right? Um, so uh, if we look at what happens if, uh, what happens if uh, A steals, then what should B do? If A's stealing, B ought to steal. If A's not stealing, then B ought to steal, because seven's better than six, right? So what's gonna happen? We're gonna end up there. Both players have a dominant strategy to, to steal, but what are they gonna end up with? Four and four. Instead, they should end up at six and six. So this is what the prisoner dilemma says is that both players have a dominant strategy and the result of both those players playing their dominant strategy is worse than if they cooperated, okay? So what you'd like to do is you'd like to have a law that would enforce cooperation or at least lead to cooperation. If there's force, we could say lead to cooperation. So, Econ 105, 
ECOM 105, what we, we talked about um, what happens uh, if I want to have uh, cigarette laws against cigarette uh, uh, advertising. Well, the, the point that we made in 105 was that the, what the cigarette manufacturers found out was that by advertising, they don't increase the number of people that are smokers, but what they do is they can move you to smoking Marlboro instead of smoking Lucky Strike. So the four cigarette manufacturers at the time get together and they say, Hokey Smokes, Paul Winkle, if we just stopped advertising on television, we'd save all this money and we'd still keep the same amount of customers, right? But after they agree to that, what do they do? They all go back to their advertising folks and they say, mm, advertise, <laughs> right? Because if the other three are going to advertise, they need to keep advertising. If the other three don't advertise, they're going to gain market share. So everybody's dominant strategy is to advertise. So how do you get around the prisoner's dilemma? You have a law against advertising cigarettes on television. So you might have thought that the law about against advertising cigarettes on television uh, was because the um, you know, the uh, Lung Association or Cancer Association got their lobbyists to make that law. It could easily have been that the lobbyists for the cigarette manufacturers were able to get the law passed in order to what? To, in, to make sure that the cooperative strategy happened, okay? So what you want to do is, that, you know, the point to here is when you're making laws, you, you want to make it so that people can cooperate. Right? You want to have a law that increases the ability of folks to cooperate. All right, um, for, uh, uh, for Wednesday, um, we will be uh, pretty well uh, getting to, um, we'll get through this, uh, uh, the, the problems that we talked in the, in the last part of this, and we'll, we may get to contract law. So you might want to take, just take a look at chapter three uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the textbook. And lastly, did any, I didn't get anybody that said they wanted to buy a hard copy. Is that, is that correct? Okay, I'm going to give you what's called their BATNA, which we'll talk about. Uh, they're, the, they're, the, the, they, will take, they will take $15. So if any of you wants to buy a, a hard copy for $15, send me an email and I'll tell them that was it. <laughs>